is the Lord. I mean, when you think about all that he has done for us and through us, things that we don't even have to account for to think about, like breathing, the fact that he gives us that air to do that, how are you going to respond to a God who does that for you? I mean, because it compels us to want to, to respond. I mean, and there's two ways that you can respond. We can respond positively or we can respond negatively to that. I came across a video this week uh, of a, an unusual response. It was a video uh, of a game called Among Us. Uh, it's an online game where you try to deduce, you know, who the bad guy is, you know, basically. And in this, there is a younger voice that's in this video, and he's asking for help with his math. And one of the other players that you see in the video is, a, is an older kid. And so in the midst of them playing this game, he's helping this younger kid do his math homework. And while his suggestion was good, I know some of our teachers would say, yeah, but we don't want them to count with their fingers. But that's kind of what he taught this younger kid, this first grader do. It's like, okay, if it's eight minus two, you know, or 10 minus seven or whatever, he was like, get your fingers up there. And so this kid was really excited that he got help with his math while he was playing this game. Now, that, that older kid, he didn't have to respond positively like that. He could have ignored him. He could have made fun. I've heard plenty of awful stuff online playing video games. But nonetheless, here was this young kid who uh, you know, had someone respond positively to him he even made application. You know, it's like, you know, he, he had this one problem where he thought the answer was six, but the answer really was seven. He goes, well, how'd you figure that out? He goes, well, you told me how. I used my fingers. Uh, and so the question is, how are you and I going to respond when it comes to the greatness of God? And so this morning, we're going to see that Jesus makes himself available to us. Kind of like that older kid in that game. He was available. He chose to be there. That Jesus is going to give us opportunity so that we can respond in kind. So God isn't just going to make himself available. He's going to give you and I, each and every one of us, the opportunity where we can respond to him. And so then the question is going to be, okay, how are we going to do that? And so are you ready to respond to the awesomeness, the goodness, the incredibleness of Jesus today. Let's pray. There, Jesus, we do thank you for this day. We thank you. You are so great, God. We are so thankful for the things that you give us. And God, even when we're not, we should be. Uh, there is so much that you have done for us, God, that our eyes will never see, that our minds will never comprehend or understand, but yet you have done it because you care and you love for us. And so, God, I pray that as we look at your truth today that you will help us to respond rightly to the awesomeness that is you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we've been making our way through Mark, and, and hey, we get to turn a chapter today. We're going to be in chapter 14. And so if you're keeping count, it's 14, 15, 16. We're almost there. But as we've been making our way through Mark, Mark wants us to see right now the significance in the last week of Jesus' life. And oh, what an incredible week the last week of Jesus' life truly, truly is. We know that on Sunday he came into Jerusalem and was celebrated. We know on Monday that he came and he cleansed the temple, restoring God's house to be a house of prayer and a place of worship. On Tuesday, he exposed the hypocrisy of those religious leaders who should have been pointing people to God, but instead were pointing people away from him. And then on the end, the eve of that Tuesday, we've been talking about how Jesus was preparing his disciples for a future that was coming, a future that was coming in just a few short days, a future that was coming in just a few short months, preparing them for a future that, well, you and I, even today as his disciples, are still waiting for and so now we make ourselves to Wednesday, and Jesus is back in Bethany, and it, it's while he's in Bethany that Mark writes this, starting in Mark chapter 14, verse 1. Now the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes who were seeking to seize him by stealth 
and to kill him. So those whom Jesus has corrected, those whom Jesus has exposed their hypocrisy, now are looking for ways to seize him by stealth to kill him. For they were saying, not during the festival though, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. See, at this particular time, it's a feast of Passover. They would say the estimates that Jerusalem's population would double during this particular celebration. So you had people coming from all over the countryside back to celebrate the Passover. And see, while those in Jerusalem, while those religious leaders were not keen on Jesus, all the people of the countryside All the people who have come into Jerusalem, well, they were because they had seen Jesus. They had heard Jesus. They had benefited from Jesus' miracles. And so what is it then that Mark wants us to see theologically? What is it about God that we are going to see in the encounter today? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to see the grace of Jesus Now, I know grace is kind of one of those words. It can be a name, right? We know that it's something that we don't deserve. And so what we're going to see is the grace of Jesus in the midst of a lot of crazy things going on. So let's pick back up in verse 3. And so Mark writes, While he, Jesus, was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, And reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume of pure nard. And she broke the vial, and she poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, Why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii in the money given to the poor. And so they're, making, they're, they're arguing why, why this precious gift, why this gift that had, was the cost of some 300 days wages, so nearly a year's worth of sacrifice and work, They're arguing about why this has been used in such a fashion. In fact, they go on, and and not only do they become indignant with one another, now they are scolding her, the end of verse 5 says. But let's look at verse 6. But Jesus said, let her alone. Yeah, I kind of wonder the tone. I kind of wonder the look in that particular moment. Why do you bother her, he asked. She has done a good thing deed to me. Now think about that. That's high praise. Jesus, God himself, is saying she has done a good deed. For you will always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand or the burial. Truly I say to you, whenever the gospel is preached in the whole world, that what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory to her. Verse 10 says, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priest in order to betray him. And they were glad when they heard this, and they promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. So all of this is going on in the background. And so with this understanding, Jesus comes to us despite our shortcomings. I want you to think about that because I know sometimes we don't feel we're worth it. We don't feel we're good enough. We, in fact, we remove ourselves from situations sometimes of our own accord because we are afraid of us even more so than we are afraid of other people, right? Have you ever said no to something before it was ever asked because you just didn't think, right, that you were worth it or that it was going to turn out good? But Jesus comes to us despite our shortcomings. See, Jesus refrains from rest. 
See, Jesus was very close friends with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, right? He had been in their home before. In fact, he had been in their home the past several evenings. But on this evening, instead of going back and resting, and I know you guys thought that Tuesday was never going to end in the life of Jesus, it was a huge day in his life, right? He spends most of Tuesday talking with those religious leaders and dealing with what questions they are asking him. And then at the end of that day, he spends a great deal of time preparing his disciples for what's to come. He knows his time with them is short. And so he's trying to fill them up with everything, right? While he has the opportunity. So you know that has to be emotionally and physically draining. But yet he goes back to Bethany, and on Wednesday, instead of taking time of rest, he goes to Simon's house, right? Instead of going away from the crowd, he comes to the house of Simon, and he does this for the evening meal. And he does this despite Simon's reputation. You might say, but what do you mean reputation? Well, even in Scripture, he's referred to as what? Simon the leper. Now, we know that Simon was no longer a leper or nobody would have been there, right? So this is somebody that Jesus has healed, and yet Jesus is there, and he comes to his house, and he does this to restore his public standing with his presence. And so by the fact that Jesus is there in his house is speaking volumes to everybody else, right? Because you know they're going to be afraid to go. Did the healing work? Is it going to last? What about the way he used to be? But yet Jesus is now here in this place. And not only is he there in his presence, but he intimately interacts with Simon and others as they recline around the table. Now, as a society, we have become very utilitarian with food, right? I mean, basically, we've turned eating into, I just need whatever nourishment there is, and we move on. But back then, eating a meal, especially the evening meal, was not just a time of, hey, let's throw food in our face. It was a time of conversation, of interaction. It was a time of community. And so you've seen, you know, artist renditions and stuff. They weren't sitting around a kitchen table as we know it. They're there on a low table on the floor, leaning back against cushions, and they are there talking. And so at this moment, Jesus and his presence in this home talking, interacting. He is there despite any shortcoming because he had every reason to be somewhere else, didn't he? He could have been somewhere resting. He could have been somewhere away from the people. He could have been somewhere where he wasn't actively engaging, and yet there he was. The arrival of Jesus brought life to a formerly empty home. I want you to think about that. A home that was cursed, A home that no new life because Simon was literally a dead man walking, right? That's what leprosy is. But Jesus has done what? He has brought life back to this empty place. And not just that, he has brought relationship to a previously disconnected man. That is what Jesus does for you and I. That is the grace and the hope of the good news. He takes us which was dead and makes us alive, and then he reconnects us relationally in a way that we were totally broken and disconnected. And he does that not because we're good enough. He does it despite our shortcomings. Man, that is an amazing thing. Not just that, we see that Jesus values what we offer without comparison. Now, as a people, we like to compare. I like this better than that, or that's nice, but what about this? We do a lot of comparison, but Jesus values what we offer without that type of comparison. Now, I know this because Scripture back in the, in the book of Psalms tells us that the best we have to offer God is but filthy rags. And so let's really be honest, folks. Your good deed or your good deed or my good deed, regardless of how good that is, as we try to compare it to each other, is but rubbish to God. Not that he's not appreciative, 
But I mean, it just doesn't measure up. And so God's not interested in the comparison. And we can see this from this particular scripture. Jesus shares with the disciples that equality of service and sacrifice do not determine the value or the worth of what somebody has to offer. See, a woman who the other gospel writers identify as Mary, as in Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, quietly gave of her costly perfume made of a rare root that comes from India, and it's one-time application, okay? So not only is this rare, and it has come from the farthest parts of the world, but it is encased in an alabaster vial that once you break it open, there's no way to seal it back up. It is a one-time use. And you've already heard about how expensive they, they, they assumed that it was. And so quietly, she comes up, she breaks this open, and she begins to pour it upon Jesus' head. And Jesus indicates that what she has done, only she could uniquely do, right? Nobody else in that room could have done what she did because it was her perfume, and she was the one that was doing it. And in doing so, she reveals her sacrificial service, that she understood the significance of his coming death when nobody else did. Because have you noticed how the disciples sometimes always seem like they're one to two steps behind Jesus? Jesus has told them things, but it, it's just kind of slow on the uptake. Now, now, guys, we, we, that happens to me, too. My wife will tell me stuff, and she'll tell me something not just once, but she'll tell me sometimes, sometimes twice, and then when she brings it up the third time, I act like I've never heard it before, right? And you're smiling because you know that that's happened to you, right? And so the disciples were kind of a couple steps behind, but not Mary. Mary understood that she was doing something in preparation for his burial. She understood that he was going to die. Now, he had told the disciples this, and they kind of got it and kind of didn't get it, but maybe it was because she got it because she paid attention and listened. Because see, if you remember, John will write of us and tell us about the story of Mary and Martha, and he will tell us how Mary sat at Jesus' feet and listened to everything he had to say, but Martha was busy doing stuff, right? Could it be she paid attention, and for her, two and two equaled four? She got it, right? And so Jesus isn't comparing what she's doing to anybody else. She is doing something that only she uniquely could do. And so the acknowledgement of Jesus shows that everything is significant when it is freely given in his name. Think about that. Everything that you and I do in his name is significant. And the fact that it's different from somebody else is expected and supposed to be that way. Because one of the cool things about God is that God made each and every one of us in this room radically unique, and he did so on purpose. You think about how different we are, not just in how we look and how we act, but I mean, and he's not just done it for those of us in this room. He's done it for the billions that are on this planet. How amazing, how creative, how special God is in that. And so Jesus values what we offer without comparison. So whether it's big or small or expensive or not, the fact that it's freely given in his name, that's what makes it special. Jesus also shows us a better way even when we object. Now, this one's huge because I want you to know everybody in this room has rejected Jesus. What? No, I'm a believer. Yeah, you are now, but before that, you rejected him, and you rejected him, and you rejected him, and you, re you, know, you, you kind of see where I'm kind of going with this, but yet Jesus still shows us a better way even when we object, and when we look back and we think, man, I was stupid for objecting then, right? I mean, that's what we'll look back at. But in the midst of it, man, we think we're justified. And we think what we understand about God, we understand. And how could he and how could this be? But yet he continues to show us a better way. 
See, Jesus points out to the disciples that they will always have the opportunity to do good for the poor. Now, he's not saying don't do good for the poor. He's saying you will always have the opportunity. But the woman did good to him, okay? And in doing so, she showed us how to sacrificially serve the poor. We will always have the poor. We will always have people who have needs. So how do we serve them? We serve them as Jesus. We serve them by putting Jesus first. We serve them by doing as Jesus did, right? That's what she's doing. She's putting the focus on Jesus. Yes, I want to be a cup of cold water. Yes, I do want to be able to provide food. Yes, I want to provide clothing, but I also want to do it in the name of Jesus because I don't want to just meet the physical needs. I want to meet the needs that's deep inside, right? And man, only God can do that. And so their objection has been angrily shared with one another. That's what that word indignant means, angry displeasure. So I want you to see the setting. Jesus is here at the table. She has come up quietly behind him. She has broken this jar. She has poured that on his head. And somewhere in this room, right, and it's small, right, we have disciples talking to one another, and they are angrily objecting to what's going on. They are so total disregard of what they are saying to one another about how that particularly would impact or make Jesus feel, how this lady would respond. And so they are going off in this room right here. Their intent was misguided. Okay, they had this great idea, but hey, if we hadn't have done that, if she hadn't have done that, we could have given all of this money. They were mad because they thought they had a better way. It seemed right to them, right? Have you thought about the number of times we've gotten upset because it just seemed right to us, but it wouldn't be something that God would do? And so they are angry because they would have done it differently. And so they take their anger and their displeasure that's happening here in this room, and then they point it and direct it directly at Mary. Now, we know this. We can walk backwards, right? They all knew Lazarus. They all knew Mary. They knew Martha. They had wondered, why did we wait? And why is it that Lazarus had died? They were there when Jesus said, arise, and he came out of the tomb, right? They were close, but now they are in this house, and now they have gone from being angry with one another and arguing about what seems right to now they are scolding her, specifically speaking to her. Man, how reprehensible. How awful. But yet the thoughtful words of Jesus declared what was right. You notice how Jesus talked in that particular situation. He showed them how to be right to those that were wrong. And so he spoke to them, right? He said, hey, You don't need to be doing this. Why are you bothering her? She gets it. And so we understand then that some of the disciples understood and they changed. And so Jesus gave somebody who objected an opportunity and they responded. But who else was in that room and a part of that conversation? Judas was. And while it seems like it's the beginning part of a different story, it's the end of this one. And so Judas hears the same words of Jesus. Jesus is showing a better way to everybody there. Jesus knows that Judas is going to reject it, but Jesus shares it to him anyway. And so God is so gracious that even when we object, he shows us the better way. Even when we know we're not going to change, he still shares with us. And we see that 
right here. He showed how to be right even when those refused right and chose wrong. Sometimes you and I, we back away from that. We, we say no for other people. Well, I'm not going to go talk to them because, well, they've said no so many times. Look at the way they live their life. Look at what they do. But yet God says, I'm going to show a better way even when people object. So Jesus doesn't have to come to us, but he does. He brings life in relationship that we don't deserve. Amen? That's graciousness. In fact, that's why Scripture will later say, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Aren't you glad that Christ came to die for you while you were in the midst of your mess and he didn't say, up, you know, if you could take it up a couple of notches and get just a little bit better, maybe we'll talk. That's gracious. God didn't have to do that. He's holy. He's the creator of the universe. We are but blips, but vapor, but dust. But man, he does that for us. That's hopeful. Look at the generation that we live in now. They need that hope. They feel that there is no hope. That their lives are so messed up and they they feel that what we have handed to them is so broken, then why bother? But yet while we were yet sinners, Christ died. You know, you don't have to value, Jesus didn't have to value what Mary had done, but he did. And in doing so, he shows us that what she did in his name had significance and purpose. We live in a generation right now that is purposeless and aimless. They don't feel that there's a reason to do anything, but yet God is showing us here that there is a purpose for your life. And it goes beyond your occupation or your vocation or the amount of money that you make. God has created you and given you life and brought you to a place in life because he sees your value and your worth and he knows that you can accomplish something. And we see that with the life of of Mary here. That's gracious. This is why scripture will later say, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You might think, I don't have anything to offer, but that's wrong. Whatever you do in word and deed, a passing comment In a video game, an interaction you have with a clerk at Walmart, whatever it is, whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of Christ Jesus. There's purpose in what we do. Jesus doesn't have to show us a better way. Ah, but he does, right? He didn't have to, but he does. And he continues to provide it despite our numerous rejections because he desires our best. Aren't you glad God didn't give up on you? Aren't you glad that whatever you did was not one too many? You know, in the lives of of parents and grandparents everywhere, aren't you glad that when he started counting one, two, right, that, that he didn't stop counting or that his way was just simply that much better? Man, God is so gracious. That's why Scripture tells us this. Man, these are the words of Peter that he, Peter wrote later in his life. The Lord is patient with you, not willing for us or any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God is patient. Man, he's way more patient than me. Right? He's patient because he's gracious. And he's patient because he loves you. And while we on this side of eternity get frustrated, maybe it's because we're frustrated now, but that event for somebody else that's going to change their life, it hasn't happened yet. And God is patiently working that together for their good so that they can respond at the right time. God is gracious. So practically, let's wrap this up. Mark wants us to rightly respond to Jesus. 
I mean, that's what he wants for us, right? And so as a Jesus person, what does that mean? That means you need to serve Jesus. Now, okay, I'm not coming up with a laundry list of things that you need to do in the life of our church, right? That's not where I'm going. But what I am telling you is that you need to serve him. As a follower of Jesus, you need to do good with what you have, knowing that it will accomplish much. Mary did good with what she had. Jesus, the God and creator of the universe, said what she did for me was good. That means what you have to offer in the name of Jesus is good. And if you aren't using it, then you're not doing good. You are depriving. You are taking something that God has blessed you with and keeping it to yourself in a way that is wrong. Don't be that way. Find a way to do good with what God has given you. Pay attention like Mary and respond. Can we do that? Okay. Lastly, maybe you're not a Jesus person this morning. You need to surrender to Jesus. I know surrender, right? We don't like that word. Surrender implies that we lose. Maybe we use the word yield. I don't have to not do something, but I choose not to do something. I don't have to give my life to Jesus, but I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I don't have to say that God's way is the best way, and I want that for me, but I'm going to say God's way is the best way because I realize it and I want it. I don't have to, but I'm going to. If you don't know Jesus, that's what you need to do today. The disciples, they accepted the correction of Jesus. One of them didn't. One of them, how many Judases do you know, right? You got any in your class at school? Nah, we don't tend to name people that because we look at that and think, what? He betrayed God, right? I mean, I mean, we can get all dramatic. He betrayed Jesus. I want you to know that when you and I do not rightly respond to the Creator the loving God who's patient and gracious in the universe, do you know what that makes you and I? Judas. Our betrayal, we align ourselves with the enemies of God, and then we say, I don't want that. When we say no to Jesus, that's what we do. If you've never said yes to Jesus, don't be like Judas. Judas. Respond to God's graciousness. Judas had every opportunity to respond right to Jesus. He was not forced to be the bad guy to accomplish the plan of God. But God knew that he was going to respond the way he did. You have hope right now, this side of eternity. I want to ask you to rightly respond to Jesus today bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. I want to invite you to respond. As our worship team is coming forward, I want you to hear these words of Scripture. Do not see, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you away from your sin? God is not here to condemn. He's here to show you a better way. And today, I want to ask you to respond to that. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for this day. We thank you that you are so gracious, God. And God, I pray that we will respond to you. We don't deserve you, but God, we want to respond. And so, God, I ask that as soon as I finish praying, that if there are those in this room that need to respond to you, God, that they will. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.